On the surface, Latuya Bay looks picturesque. The clean waters, the glorious fjord, a tight entrance that opens into a blissful inner bay. But all the things that make it so perfect are unfortunately the exact same things that make it so dangerous to those who enter. Intrigued by an odd line that ran through the forest that surrounded the bay, Jean-Francois de Galoup, La Perouse, was the first person to discover the bay in 1786. His crew were also the first people to fall victim to the bay not long after entering it. The entrance to the bay is narrow, only 500 meters in width. This meant that it was prone to extremely strong tidal currents. As the crew of the three small boats, dispatched by Jean-Francois to measure the depth of the entrance, would find out. Two of the three boats ended up getting caught in the rolling tides of the entrance and capsizing. Their bodies have never been found. Hence how Cenotaph Island, meaning empty tomb, got its name. However, if you did manage to pass through the entrance, the bay itself was incredible. And on the 9th of July, 1958, the bay had attracted a few ships. The some more, on it were husband and wife, Orville and Mildred Wagner. They decided to anchor Gilbert Inlet for the night of the 9th. Alongside them in the bay was the Edry, with the father and son crew, Howard G. Ulrich, and his son of the same name. They were placed in Anchorage Cove, on the southern side of Cenotaph Island. And finally came the Badger, who had another husband and wife crew, William A. Swanson and his wife Vivian, who were anchoring near the head of the bay for protection, not far from the Edry. The night had seemed normal for everyone in the bay, but then the ground began to shake, and the noise of a rumble started to grow and grow and grow. That rumble had been heard before though, but not by Jean-Francois. After part of his crew had been lost, he left the bay, never to return, stating in his log that this bay, which may seem a haven, concealed the greatest dangers. Its beauty was a cruel mask for the deadly tides that claimed the lives of our comrades. We hastened to leave this fatal place. Long after he had left though, the geology of the bay would mean that incredible tsunamis would be part and parcel of its story as much as the picturesque views would be. When earthquakes and the subsequent landslides would happen, the narrow width of the bay and the U-shaped seafloor would act like an amplifier for wave generation, making the subsequent tsunami all the more intense. In 1899, an earthquake had released a significant amount of rock that tumbled into the bay, causing a tsunami that killed the five inhabitants on Cenotaph Island, and creating a new prominent razor line along the shore, showing all those who entered in the future how high the waves had managed to reach along the sides of the bay. There was one more tsunami event in 1936, but little evidence remains of that event. There were no casualties, and although perhaps there was a new tree line cut, all memory of what had come before was going to be completely wiped away by what was occurring on the night of the 9th. It was now a quarter past ten in the evening, and the rumble had grown almost deafening. Aboard the Edry, Howard Ulrich and his son had been shaken awake by the violent motion that had now invaded the calm of the bay. Eventually though, with the noise and the movement dying down to silence once again, Howard Ulrich had thought that everything was over. Here he describes how he was feeling at the time. There was a slight pause. I thought that everything was over with. But some movement up there caught my attention out of the corner of my eye, and so I looked directly up there, and what I observed was a, uh, like an atomic explosion. After this big flash came a huge wave. It looked like just a big wall of water. What he was witnessing was the aftermath of a 7.8 magnitude earthquake that was in the process of throwing 90 million tons of material into the bay and thus generating one of the biggest tsunamis in human history. A tsunami that was coming directly at the pair. Watching the approaching wave, he threw his son a life preserver and simply thought, you're looking at death. It would take around two and a half minutes before the wave would eventually reach the pair. As it approached, he noted that the wave was just coal black and full of logs, just straight up and down. It was actually a pretty horrific looking sight. I just thought, you know, this is, this is the end. No, no way you're going to get out of this. Thinking quickly, however, 
Ulrich positioned the boat facing the wave and tried to push into it, hoping to ride above it. As the wave approached them, it was now reaching a height of around 100 feet, and as they tried to move, they couldn't. Their anchor was stuck. They were chained in place, and then the wave hit them. I had 40 fathoms of anchor chain, and it started running out off the boat. It came to the end of the 40 fathoms, just snapped it like a string, and then we were free, but we were still in the front of the wave. They were carried on the wave over the tops of trees, Howard Ulrich noting that they must have been at least 80 feet above the tops of trees. And when you add to this the trees in the bay ranging from 60 to 100 feet in height, it must have been a truly terrifying experience to be aboard the Edry that night. The Ulriches were the lucky ones, however. Just as the wave had washed them up the side of the bay, the backwash pulled them back into the bay to where they had started. Having survived the biggest tsunami in human history, they started looking for other survivors. But for the first time that night, they were now alone in the bay. The Badger was anchored not far from the Edry. Like the Ulrichs, when the earthquake hit, the Swansons had a very similar reaction. Bill Swanson describing the moments after as, I know you can't ordinarily see the glacier from where I was anchored, but I know what I saw that night. The glacier had risen in the air, jumping and shaking. Big cakes of ice were falling off. Indeed it had. Minutes after the quake had struck, the side of a five and a half thousand foot peak on one side of Latuya Bay began to fall into the water below, plunging almost 2,000 feet of rock into the bay, creating the wave that was now targeting the Badger and the other two boats in the bay. Like the Edry, the Swanson turned their boat towards the wave, hoping, like the Edry, to overcome it. It threw them like the Ulrich's 80 feet into the air, out over La Chausse Pit, and dumped them, stern first, into the open ocean. They had survived, just. Although they were alive, their boat had begun to sink. Dressed in nothing but their underclothes, they managed to board the eight-foot skiff attached to their boat, before waiting several hours for the first rescue efforts to appear on the scene, surrounded by nothing but debris and an incredible sense of luck. While the other two boat captains took time to react, the Sunmoor, with both the Wagners on board, jumped into action upon hearing the quake. They immediately turned and fled, hoping to escape out of the bay before the wall of water would reach them. Initially, they were positioned much closer to the actual epicenter of the wave, but Swanson reports seeing them. Just as they attempted to exit out of the entrance of the bay, they were caught by the wave and thrown out over Harbour Point. He was the last person to see them. After the dust had settled, all that remained of the ship and all those on board was oil, showing the place where the ship had been sunk. And just as luck had played a role in the survival of the other two ships that night, it had run out for the Sunmore and both of those on board. It would be midnight before the first ship, who heard the distress call of Howard Ulrich, would arrive on the scene. The Lumen, picking its way through the debris field left from the monster wave, managed to find and pick up the Swansons who were suffering from broken ribs as a result of a tree that had smashed through the pilot house of the Badger. Other than this, and the unfortunate loss of all those in the Sunmore, there were no further casualties. There could have been several more if it were not for fortunate circumstances. A group of 8-10 to 10 rock climbers were stationed on Cenotaph Island the evening of the 9th. They were meant to leave the following day on the 10th, but due to incoming fog and weather, the pilot forced them to leave on the 9th instead. It saved their lives. They lifted off at 9pm on the 9th of July, just around one hour before the earthquake and subsequent wave hit. A wave that would have killed them all. Since the deadly tsunami hit, scientists have looked at the geology of the bay and determined that events like the tsunami of 1958 happen around once every quarter century. On any given day, you have a 1 in 9,000 chance of being struck by a wall of water that struck the three boats harboured in Latuya Bay on the 9th of July, 1958. I think for me, it's a place that I'm going to put off visiting, at least for the foreseeable future. If you enjoyed this video, why don't you try this one? It's just as interesting.